What happens when you lock Britain, Germany, and Italy in a room and tell them to design one jet that can do it all, strike ground targets, crush enemy defenses, and still dogfight in the sky? You get the Tornado, a swing-wing monster born from Cold War panic, built despite national rivalries, and somehow, it worked. This is the story of a jet that flew too low, hit too hard, and stayed in service way too long, yet earned the nickname Tonka, like a kid's toy truck. Spoiler alert, it was anything but a toy. Back in the late 1960s, NATO faced a serious issue. Their Cold War fleets were aging fast, and technology was advancing so quickly that a jet could be cutting edge one decade and obsolete the next. Many aircraft programs on both sides of the Iron Curtain collapsed under their own weight. So, the biggest names in Europe asked a bold question. Instead of everyone going solo, why not team up and build one aircraft that could do everything? And that's how the idea of a multi-role combat aircraft was born. First up, Britain. After cancelling their TSR-2 strike jet and failing to buy the American F-111, they were desperate for a new partner. They were already working with France on the Jaguar, and both sides briefly planned a swing-wing jet called AFVG, which looked suspiciously like the future tornado. But in true French fashion, they left in 1967 to make another mirage, leaving Britain alone but now armed with solid blueprints. Meanwhile, West Germany was eyeing its own swing-wing strike jet with U.S. help, and Italy, with its rich aviation legacy, wanted back in the game and a replacement for its aging fleet. By 1968, a powerful coalition was born. West Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, Canada, and Britain, all working toward a single, one-jet-does-it-all solution. From low-level strikes to high-altitude interceptions, this was Europe's Avengers Assemble moment, just with more blueprints and fewer capes. But like every group project, some partners got cold feet. By late 1968, Belgium, Canada, and the Netherlands backed out. Maybe the jet was too complex, or maybe British catering was too much to handle. Either way, three nations remained, the UK, West Germany, and Italy. In March 1969, they officially founded the Panavia Aircraft Company in Munich, a trinational alliance to design the new jet. Each nation took on a piece of the puzzle. A Britain's BAC built the front fuselage and tail. A Germany's MBB handled the center fuselage. A Italy's Air Italia crafted the wings. Even the engines were a joint effort, the RB199 turbofan, created by a mix of Rolls-Royce, UK, MTU, Germany, and Fiat, Italy. The workload split reflected their enthusiasm. Britain and Germany took 42.5% each, while Italy rounded out the remaining 15%. And honestly, given European stereotypes, that division sounds about right. But collaboration wasn't always smooth. Every air force had its own wish list. The RAF wanted a two-seater jet for low-level all-weather missions, while some Germans pushed for a nimble single-seater. Two concepts were born, the Panavia 100, single-seat, and Panavia 200, twin-seat. In the end, the Panavia 201, because the RAF refused to compromise on having a second pilot for terrain following and navigation in the days before computers could do it all. And thus began the creation of one of Europe's most iconic jets, the Tornado. In 1971, the Tornado program moved from sketchbook to full development, with a hard focus, low-level penetration strikes. Britain's brass were so sure this jet would deliver they predicted it would make up two-thirds of their future combat fleet. Bold claim. After five years of design battles and plenty of arguments about catering, the prototype P-01 finally flew on August 14, 1974. It lifted off from a West German airbase, crewed by a British-German test team, a neat symbol of the partnership. The 33-minute maiden sortie was clean, to everyone's relief. By 1979, the first production tornado rolled out of BAC Wharton in the UK, deliveries began around 1980, and nearly 1,000 airframes would be built, a remarkable result for what many thought was a long shot. RAF crews nicknamed it Tonka, a nod to toy trucks famed for toughness and simplicity. The joke stuck, but the tornado's engineering was anything but simple. The Panavia tornado was literally an answer to a wish list. Short field capability, low level speed, precision strike, and the ability to dogfight if needed. The toolbox. Almost every clever trick of the era. Its signature was the variable geometry, swing, wing, the 1970s favorite compromise. Swept wings gave high-speed performance but were terrible at low speeds. 
Delta wings offered speed but needed canards and had high stall speeds. The swing wing blended both, wings forward for lift on takeoff slash landing, swept to 45 degree for efficient low-level cruise, and tucked to 67 degrees for high-speed dashes, ideal for evading interceptors or getting home in time for tea. A neat engineering fix addressed a tricky problem. The tornado's weapons pylons were wing-mounted, so when the wings moved the stores would have moved too. Panavia solved this with pivoting pylons that keep weapons facing forward regardless of wing sweep. The twin-engine, two-seat layout boosted survivability and divided duties. Pilot flies, navigator-slash-weapons officer manages sensors and attacks. And the avionics. Cutting edge for the late 1970s. The Tornado used an early hybrid fly-by-wire system that reduced pilot workload while keeping analog backups. It was also one of the first fighters with an integrated digital computer and a terrain-following radar, TFR, that could literally fly the jet at low altitude. Couple TFR with autopilot and the Tornado could snake through valleys at 100 to 200 feet, night or bad weather, decades before that became routine. Picture that next time you see a movie pilot grinding through a canyon, the Tornado could do it on autopilot back in the 1970s. For longer missions the jet had a retractable refueling probe, rounding out a design build for the Cold War's key idea. Sneak under the radar, hit high-value targets, and get out fast. The Tornado was basically the era's most aggressive self-driving sports car, except it dropped bombs and went supersonic. One of the Tornado's coolest features? Thrust reversers. Yep, like a passenger jet, it could blast air forward to stop fast after landing. Few fighters ever had that trick. Early test models could even supercruise, fly supersonic without afterburners, but production jets lost that edge as weight crept up. Still, it was no ordinary jet. The Tornado program aimed for one jet for all, but reality split it into specialized variants. The Tornado IDS, Interdictor Slash Strike, was the main one. Germany called it the PA-200, the UK the GR-1. Its job? Fly low, hit hard, get home fast. Then came the Tornado ECR, Germany and Italy's radar hunter. It carried harm missiles to destroy enemy air defenses. And finally, the Tornado ADV, Britain's interceptor. It had a longer nose, bigger radar, and air-to-air -air missiles. Early F-2S were so unfinished they flew with a concrete block instead of radar, the famous Blue Circle radar. The later F-3 fixed that and guarded Allied skies during the Gulf War. The Tornado soon proved its worth. In 1991, RAF, Italian, and Saudi crews flew low-level strikes over Iraq, using the brutal JP-233 runway denial system. Losses were heavy at first, but with new tactics and laser-guided bombs, tornadoes became precision killers. They went on to fight in Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq 2003, Libya 2011, and Afghanistan. Germany's ECRs hunted radars to keep NATO jets safe. By 2019, the RAF retired its last tornado after nearly 40 years. Italy and Germany plan to follow soon as Eurofighters and F-35s take over. But what a legacy it leaves, a jet that proved Europe could build something world-class together. Fast, rugged, deadly, and endlessly adaptable. With terrain-following radar, smart weapons, and all-weather capability, the Tornado set the standard for modern strike fighters. Its upgrades, GPS, storm shadow missiles, and advanced sensors, kept it sharp well into the digital age. The Tornado truly lived up to its name, a storm forged by teamwork, roaring through the Cold War and beyond.